OK, so thanks, everyone, for coming. So I'm, my name is Michael Schatz. I'm an assistant professor here in the quantitative de biology department. Uh, before I was here, I was at the University of Maryland with Steven Salzberg. Before that, I was at the Institute for Genomic Research, Tiger. So I've been in genomics for more than 10 years. And uh, throughout that time, genome assembly has been a major research interest of mine. So I'm going to kind of walk you through uh, some of the algorithms, some of the concepts, and then sort of we'll get hands on with some of the data. So I think that genome, genome assembly as a concept should be familiar to many people in the room, but I'm guessing you haven't studied it intensely for 10 years like I have. So I'm going to start by giving a relatively gentle introduction to like what are the major concepts. Uh, just to kind of, you know, set the stage for this, talk about, you know, what are the properties that we need, what are the, what are the, what are the data types that we're really going to have to have in order to have a good assembly. Then I'm going to walk through a couple of different assemblers, you know, talk about in a little bit more detail about how they work. I'm also going to talk about this project called the Assemblathon, which is this big international consortium to sort of evaluate what were the best assemblers to use for different data types. That gives us a lot of guidance about, you know, what are, what's the state of the art, what are the right algorithms, what are the right tools that we should be using. And at the end there, I'll give you this, you know, this hands-on uh, experience with, with iPlant. I think the kind of the first half, you know, the first half, you know, the sort of lecture half will be about 45 minutes, and about 45 minutes hands-on. So the story I like to tell to sort of set the stage for genome assembly is to think about, you know, imagine, imagine the scenario that you're, you just, uh, you're Charles Dickens and you just finished writing A Tale of Two Cities that begins, it was the best of times, it was the worst of times, it was the age of wisdom, it was the age of foolishness, and, and so forth. So, you know, he's, Charles is very proud of his work, you know, wants to make many copies of it, distribute it to the world. So he goes to the print shop, but instead of getting it printed up on pieces of paper, he's going to get it printed up on these long spools. So hopefully this is like my very transparent metaphor for, you know, long strands of DNA that have many copies of it. So I, I, as he's walking out of the copy shop, he trips and it falls into the paper shredder and it gets chopped up in this kind of funny way where, you know, we're going to get something like five words on each of these little fortune cookie sized pieces. So the, again, this should hopefully be the transparent metaphor of something like Illumina sequencing, shotgun sequencing over the, over the original uh, 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 molecule. So then we have this big problem of, you know, we have this big shredder bag with, you know, literally hundreds of thousands of little tiny fragments in there. You know, how are we going to possibly sort through all this information to be able to piece together the original text? How do we put them, put them all back together? So if the input was five copies of the book, and each copy is 140,000 words, five words per fragment, 140,000 fragments, all the fragments are mixed together. And in particular, uh, uh, some of the fragments are going to be identical. Now, a fragment can be identical because it you know, happened to come from the same spot in the book. But some of the times, fragments are going to be identical even if they came from you know, very, very different spots in the original text. So those are going to be very important as we start thinking through this reconstruction problem uh, in a minute. So the first thing that you might try to do, and indeed, this is exactly what all the early assemblers have ever heard of, a uh, FRAP or a Tiger Assembler or CAP3 or any of the earlier assemblers, what they try to do is something called a, what's called a greedy reconstruction. So the idea is what we're going to do is we're going to go in and we're just going to, we're going to pick a fragment using some sort of rule. So maybe, uh, maybe you're Dickens and you remember that the, you know, that the book started with a capital letter or you know, maybe you just you know, put them in sorted order and that happened to come to the top or whatever. By some way, we're going to pick a fragment to, to, to start with. And really, in, in, in some sense, the whole business of genome assembly is given some fragment, you know, what's the fragment that comes next? That's really what we, what we really want to do. Now, there's, there's lots of ways that we could do this. You know, so this is a five-word fragment that happens to end with of. You know, there's other fragments that starts with of. You know, maybe we're going to try to match them up a little bit. But in this sort of uh, uh, greedy approach, what we're going to do is we're going to try to find the, the fragment that matches up the best. So in particular, we want to find some other fragment uh, that begins with sort of the best overlap, if you will, of this fragment. So we can scan through here, and as we look through this big list, we say, aha, uh, was the best of, matches exactly the last four words there. So we can take those two fragments, and now given two, frag two fragments, each with five words on them, we can extend this out, get sort of the sixth word to this whole puzzle. Uh, this is great. It's a very uh, uh, well-defined computational problem. We can do this very readily. So we can go from six fragments, we can go to seven fragments, you can go to eight fragments, no problem. You might be tempted to think, you know, if, if imagine you had those little tiny Lego bricks that are each like four little blocks long. If we had enough of those Lego bricks, you know, I could build a bridge across the harbor. There's no inherent problem in order to being able to reconstruct these little fragments. But interesting things start to happen as, as we move through the data. So on the next uh, set of fragments, notice there are two fragments that overlap equally well. Uh, uh, they both overlap by four words. They, they have the same words on them, so that's not uh, a problem in itself. But on the very next fragment, something really interesting happens, which is that there's going to be uh, two fragments that overlap equally well. Both have four words exactly the same. But those fifth words 
start to conflict with each other. Right? So what happened is, if you remember, I'd highlighted in yellow fragments that were identical. These are, the, these are the repeats in the original book. So as we walk from sort of unique sequence into repeat back into unique, we're going to start to hit these ambiguity points where it's just not clear how you can move forward. Uh, from, this, from the sequences that are present here, it's, it's just ambiguous. There's just not enough information to decide it was the best of times, it was the worst, or it was the best of times, it was the age. You just, you just not enough information to decide. So if we're going to solve this problem, we need, we need to think a little bit smarter. Uh, the, the way that this is typically uh, thought about today is, is using uh, something called a, 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 a graph to encode the relationships. So the graph that is, is very commonly used today is something called a De Bruijn graph. Uh, there's some, let me explain what it is by, uh, by an example. So we're going to do something that is entirely unintuitive to, to get started, which is to take a short fragment which has five words on it, and from that five-word fragment, we're going to derive even shorter fragments. This seems like a silly thing to do. What we're going to do is we're going to take a five-word fragment and then derive, here's the first four uh, words on it with a little directed X and the next four words. In the, in, kind of the, in, the, in the real scenario of genome assembly, this would be something like a 100 base pair Illumina sequence. We're going to take the first 25 characters with the directed edge to the next 25 characters, to the next, char the next 25, the next 25, the next 25, the next 25, all the way across the, all the way across an individual read. And indeed, we're going to do this not just for one read, we're going to do this for all the reads, and then we're just going to keep track with a little bit of bookkeeping of who's connected to who. This seems like a, a little bit of a silly thing to do, but hopefully on this little example, where I'm simulating Charles Dickens taking the fragments, coming up in the subfragments, keeping track of who's connected to who, and then suddenly, hopefully, the original book will start to emerge itself. So this is the uh, original, uh, what's called the Bruin graph of the, of the sequences. It's entirely analogous to what, how the genome assemblers work. They're going to build up this big sort of map of all the relationships between the fragments. <clears throat> if you'll notice, when it gets started, every uh, uh, node here has exactly four words on it. This is you know, by, by construction. Uh, Sometimes, there's a, where sometimes it'll just be one fragment followed by exactly one more, by one more, by one more. Those are kind of unambiguous parts. And then sometimes there's going to be this branching involved. Uh, and that's going to be as we sort of transition between different repetitive elements. So a natural thing to do, and is indeed is exactly what uh, the assemblers do, is try to take this initial graph, which can be a little bit complicated, and try to identify parts of it that are really simple, and then try to you know, collapse it down upon itself to try to simplify it as much as possible. So this is what I would call the compressed de Bruijn graph. Uh, before, we started with uh, all the nodes had four words on them, but now they have more. Uh, uh, and actually, I, I actually had to work pretty hard to find an English sentence that had enough repetitive structure to be interesting. If you just took an English sentence at random, you would just reconstruct the entire sentence you know, from the shotgun assembly approach. But here, there's a little bit of structure to keep it interesting. So we might be tempted to compress this down even further. You know, so the kind of the concept is, is, well, there's no incoming edges here, so this is probably the beginning. There's this sort of dangling edge over here, so that's probably the end of the book. So we kind of want to find some path that walks through here that visits all the nodes. That's kind of the, the uh, underlying assumption in genome assembly. Now, we'd be, now we might be tempted to be like, well, there's only one way to do this here. We kind of loop through there, we kind of loop through there. And that's because in English, it would be extremely awkward to write. It was the best of times, it was the worst of times, it was the worst of times, it was the worst of times. It was the age of wisdom, age of wisdom, age of wisdom, age of wisdom, age of foolishness. It'd be very awkward to write that in English, but of course, in a, in a genome, that sort of tandem repetitive structure occurs all the time. So we have to be very, very careful about what sort of simplifications, what sort of operations we're going to apply. And furthermore, Dickens, for whatever reason, kind of liked this parallel structure. So if you, if you look across you know, his, the entire book and you try to piece up this graph structure, you actually get a very, very complicated graph. I'm sure. Many of you have seen those sort of hairball graphs that come out of either like protein-protein interaction networks or a genome assembly. That's actually probably a better mental model of like what's going on behind the scenes where you know, some parts of it will be very uh, straightforward, we'll have these like long contigs, and then other parts are going to be highly fragmented, especially around complicated repetitive elements. So as a result, while we would love to assemble you know, entire chromosomes end to end, the reality is, is, is you know, given today's technology, you're just probably not going to get that except if you're looking at you know, really small microbes. The, a more, much more common scenario is, is you're going to have you know, some very big contigs, which I'm showing kind of over here, some very little contigs, what I'm showing down here. That's, that's a, a much more typical uh, representation of what you have. So you can imagine, you know, given this sort of size distribution, lots of different ways that you might try to uh, summarize this. You might take the mean or the median or whatnot. A lot of that's going to get dominated by this long tail of like little tiny little pieces. So instead, the most common metric for summarizing a genome assembly is this, this kind of funny metric called the N50 size. 
So the N50 size is the size such that half of your assembly is in contigs this size or larger. So if, to give it a concrete example, here's my hypothetical one megabase genome. Uh, the largest contig is 300 KB. That doesn't reach the halfway point. 300 plus 100 doesn't reach the halfway point, plus 45 doesn't quite. It's not until we get to 30 kilobases that we finally reach halfway across the genome. You can sort of think of this as like a, a weighted median, if you will. It's like, you know, it's sort of average in that sense. Some of the contigs will be much bigger. You know, they'll be, uh, it's common to have this long tail of lots of little tiny contigs around the more complicated repetitive elements. But as is kind of a, you know, as a, as a very high level summary of how one assembly compares to another, this is, this is a pretty standard way to, to uh, approach this. So that's the kind of, you know, hopefully gentle introduction to the field. Let's kind of talk more specifically about genome assembly. So genome assembly is a, is a very important, widely, uh, 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 widely used operation. There's lots of projects underway today. There are big scale projects like the Genome 10K project, the Insect 5K project that are going out to sequence and assemble 10,000 vertebrate animals, 5,000 insects. There are other, plant, there are other uh, projects associated with uh, sort of similar tens of thousands of plants. I think I just saw yesterday hundreds of thousands of microbes, you know, enormous collections of, of, of species that we're going to try to assemble. There's a, there's a closely associated problem, but it's just enough different that it's worth considering a different problem, which is this problem of metagenomics, where we're going to go out to a sample uh, such as like in the Human Microbiome Project, where we're going to sample, you know, all the microbes that are living outside of us, inside of us, try to be able to sort of survey what is the composition that is there. Another great example of this was the Global Ocean Survey from a few years ago, and, you know, Craig Ventner sailed around the world collecting seawater. At the time of that project, they, you know, dramatically expanded the catalog of known genes by something like by ten, you know, ten times larger. It was, it was really substantial. There's lots of really uh, interesting examples showing how the microbes, how our microbial environment also influences our human health. But I think the most compelling example of this is there's this, been this great study where they took the stomach context, for, uh, stomach uh, microbial con uh, contents from uh, skinny mice and obese mice, just swapped the stomach contents, and then suddenly the skinny mice become obese and the obese mice become skinny with no other changes to diet or exercise or anything. So it's pretty clear that the microbes have a strong uh, metabolic role. In, uh, in higher organisms. So in addition, so the, the complicating part about metagenomics is that you're going to have this wide fluctuation in abundances. The most common microbes will be there, you know, maybe 10 or 100 or maybe 1,000 times more frequently than the lower common, uh, 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 less frequent microbes, which is going to change a lot of the sort of strategies that you're going to use for piecing back together the assemblies. So it's, in my mind, it's, it's, it's a related problem, but it's a separate problem such that the algorithms that you would use for a genome assembly are different than the ones that you would use from a metagenomic assembly. Uh, in a similar kind of way, uh, this sort of process of you know, assembling sequences is now becoming widely used for different uh, sequencing assays. Probably the best example of this is in, is in uh, de novo transcriptome assembly, where we're going to take RNA-seq reads, try to sort of compare them to each other to assemble full transcripts. So many of the concepts are exactly the same about uh, you know, building a de Bruijn graph or building some sort of overlap graph. Uh, finding paths through there and so forth, and error correction and so forth. But again, because there's this, there's this very large dynamic range in the most abundant to least abundantly expressed transcripts, it's, it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's a different problem. There's a different set of algorithms that should be applied there. The process is, is very much like we saw with the sort of Dickens analogy, where we're going to start with you know, some sample of DNA from uh, hopefully a relatively pure sample, share it, sequence it. And then inside the computer, we're going to be able to take this huge collection of you know, many millions or billions of reads, uh, do some sort of comparison to each other to look for how the, how the overlaps are encoded. Once those overlaps are discovered, that'll form some sort of initial graph. We'll try to simplify it as much as possible. And then we're going to overlay it with you know, either long reads or mates or physical maps, genetic maps, to try to reconstruct some sort of scaffolds that will represent something like entire chromosomes or chromosome arms. The difference for a scaffold is, is we may know that you know, overall more or less what the full sequence is, but there can be gaps along the way where we just, we know that you know, there's a gap of a thousand base pairs. We don't exactly know what the sequence is. So if you ever go to you know, GenBank and you see you know that's this region of, the, you know, of a genome where we just, we just haven't been able to fully uh, uh, decipher what the code is in there. So there's certain ingredients that you just absolutely have to have in order to have a good genome assembly. If you, if you do not have these ingredients, your project is doomed, <laughs> sadly. 
So you need to go back to the drawing board and sort of rethink your experimental design. So as we move forward with some of the examples, you know, this is, is really critical that you have the right requirements. So number one requirement that you just absolutely have to have or your project is doomed is sufficient read coverage. Uh, we're, we'll see this in more details in a second, but the, the, the gist of it is, is you know, the sequencing process is very random. It's like you know, we're throwing in all these molecules, we're going to shear them, we're going to start sequencing them. So we'll grab one from over here, we'll grab one from over here, we'll grab from over here. You know, when, we, when we've sequenced the genome to so-called 1x coverage, we don't actually have even the entire genome sequence just because there's this randomized process at play. So the only way we're going to be able to put these sequences together is to pretty substantially oversample the genome, uh, get much deeper coverage. Today, my sort of rule of thumb with sort of traditional standard uh, luminous sequencing is to target something like 100x coverage, just so you have enough oversampling to put it all together. Uh, the next ingredient they just have to have is just sufficient read length to get over the complicated repeats. So what I'm trying to show here is kind of a cartoon version of one of those De Bruijn graphs like we saw with Charles Dickens. So what the assembler is going to do is, you know, compare sequences to each other, you know, figure out how they're related, and it'll, it'll inevitably have some sort of pattern like this, where there's probably some repetitive element here in red, flanked by some unique sequences on either side. The assembler will discover this and be like, yep, yep there's a repeat there. There's no, reason, there's no reason that you need to sort of pre-filter out repeats. The assembler can, will readily recognize where those are. But what happens is it's like, well, the assembler go, well, I'm not sure, should green be connected to pink or orange or blue? How, you know, how are all these things connected? Uh, so instead of you know, making mistakes or getting it wrong, well, in a scenario like this, it'll probably output five separate contigs, the one from the green, one from the blue, one from red, one from orange, one from pink. Each will be pretty uh, relatively small uh, in this scenario. However, if we can overlay this with longer reads or may pairs or some sort of other linking information, we can recognize, oh yeah, this green segment is connected to orange, this blue is connected to this pink, and we'll be able to separate this out, leave in two copies of the repeat, which is what we want to see, right? We want to, we want to pull those apart, have just two contigs instead of five. And then the third ingredient that you just absolutely have to have is, is sufficient data quality. And I actually mean this in, in this sort of very broad sense. So obviously, if, if your sequencing instrument is making a lot of sequencing errors, that's going to be problematic. But then also upstream of that, if your library preparation is, you know, has contamination or biases or the, you know, the sample you collected from is, is, is in some way contaminated, that could be really problematic. Uh, a really uh, a, a horrific example of this is I, I heard this story about you know, they were trying to sequence this, uh, this old plant. There was a really limited sample that had been grafted onto another tree and then for whatever reason they extracted the DNA right from the junction point so they thought they were getting what was grafted but in reality they were collecting all the DNA from the host. So if, obviously your assembly is, is going to be pretty limited. Uh, uh, another sort of more positive example of this comes from the, uh, about uh, eight years ago there was a big study of multiple species of Drosophila. Now Drosophilas are teeny tiny so it takes you know, hundreds of, of flies to be able to extract enough DNA. And during this process they were extracting the DNA from the flies but they also discovered that there was this, uh, this symbiote that was living inside of it. So while they were assembling all these fly genomes they were also assembling all these parasites along the way. There's a great paper in genome biology of something like you know, the, the serendipitous discovery of novel Wolbachia species. This is like a great uh, uh, side effect of this, of this project to discover new species present. But of course all of that is going to sort of contaminate your data in, in one way or another as we go to put it all back together. So like I was alluding to, so coverage is really important because the sequencing process we think, we hope, is this sort of randomized process. So the mental model that I like to have for this is, you know, imagine uh, rain is falling down from the sky and is landing on what starts out as a dry skywalk, uh, sidewalk. So because the sidewalk is dry, of course, as the first raindrop falls on it, you know, it's going to land in isolation. It'll be, go from that little spot will suddenly become wet. The rest of the sidewalk will be wet, oh, will be dry. As the, sort of the next raindrop falls, it'll probably also be dry pavement, dry pavement, dry pavement, dry pavement. The sort of, the, the, the interpretation of this is the first sequences that you get are probably just going to be from isolated parts of the genome. But then eventually, as enough sort of rain falls, enough sort of coverage builds up, the drops will, will, will tend to overlap on top of each other, and that's what we can detect, that's what we can discover. If we saturate the surface, eventually the entire surface will become wet. So just to kind of walk through this in a little more detail, here's kind of a, a simulated uh, uh, example where I've taken, we'll say, a one megabase pair genome along here, and I've been sequencing it with 100 base pair reads such that I have exactly one X coverage. So the, re the reads are falling in, 
I've sequenced uh, a total of, of, uh, of, of, you know, what should have been the equivalent of one copy of the entire genome. But if you make a little profile of how much, cover you, how much coverage you have from this sort of randomized exper uh, experience, on average, yes, indeed, you do have 1x coverage, but notice, you know, sometimes it goes a little bit higher, sometimes it goes a little bit lower. Up here in the corner, I've made a little uh, histogram of this, and what you'll see is this bar that's the tallest represents 1x coverage. So that's good. We do have, on average, what we expect. But something like 38% or so of your, of your genome just isn't going to be covered at 1x coverage. Uh, this, this sort of distribution here is, is the, is the, is the well-known, well-characterized Poisson distribution, which is just the... Uh, it's just the fundamental limits of the sequencing process. You just can't escape it. You might think, oh, you know, we'll, we'll try to do something to, to overcome this, but this is just, uh, this is just how it's going to work. <clears throat> so at 1x coverage, we're going to be missing something like 38% of the genome. At 2x coverage, it gets better. We're down to maybe uh, you know, 14 or so percent of the genome missing. At 4x coverage, it gets better again, uh, but still up, you know, a percent or so missing. Uh, 8x coverage is the sort of transition point where there's some, where sort of by the pure probability, if you just sort of run the numbers, is the transition point where 99.9% .9 of your uh, genome should be covered, which overall is pretty good. You know, we'll have the vast majority of it assembled. But if you're looking at a genome that's on the order of, say, a billion base pairs, that 0.1% can still represent a lot of sequence that's there. Furthermore, at 1x coverage, you know, at 2x coverage, at, the, at kind of the low end of this distribution, it's just really hard to figure out uh, uh, where those reads are going to overlap. Uh, so that's why, you know, back in the sort of Sanger days, 8x coverage was a, was a reasonable rule of thumb for how much coverage to go for. But today, like I said before, you want to target much higher, uh, approaching 100x. Uh, if you want to kind of see the details for this, you know, this little review paper uh, published a couple of years ago, you know, we, we, we modeled, you know, how well this sort of equation works. We looked at a Sanger assembly where, you know, kind of the, the statistics worked out. Uh, uh, you could get pretty big contigs from low coverage. We were looking at sort of the spectrum as the read lengths get shorter, what happens there, and, you know, the conclusion added up, uh, as, as I said. So now that we've sort of, you know, done enough sequencing, we've oversampled the genome by a lot. Uh, we can follow that same sort of uh, uh, algorithm that Dickens had, had, I had sort of shown you with Dickens. We're going to take the sequences, sort of chop them up into subsequences, compare them to each other, keep track of all these relationships. That's going to build together some sort of initial uh, De Bruijn graph or some sort of initial assembly graph. We can compress this down to build up our initial set of contigs. These are these assembled sequences that are first put together. Depending on which paper you're reading, these are sometimes called the unitigs, these are sometimes called the unipass. You can just think of them as like the initial contigs that are output. Now these, these unipasses are going to end for a couple different reasons. So, the, so kind of, you know, one reason is that you just have lack of coverage, that you know, beyond this green segment here, there should be something else, but we just didn't have enough coverage, we just kind of like fell off. We've, we've kind of went from wet pavement back to dry pavement. This is actually the best case scenario, because all you have to do, all you have to do is go spend more money, get deeper coverage, add it in there, and we'll be okay. <clears throat> the second reason why these uh, unitigs can end is because of, because of error. We'll see an example in a second, but it, but it could be the case where this should all just go straight through, but then because there's some error in the data, it's going to introduce some false branching and things uh, uh, that will sort of confuse the assembler. This is, this is okay, the, you know, the assemblers can uh, pretty readily recognize sort of isolated error, but if there's systematic error to your data, uh, it's really going to complicate things, it's going to be really hard to overcome. At the end of the day, the fundamental reason why these, why these unitigs end is going to be because of repeats. You know, the assembler will put everything together, it'll be perfectly error free, but it's just because of this ambiguity that we saw from Dickens, it'll tend to leave these as separate contigs rather than stitching them all together. So just to kind of give it a little more detail, so the errors, uh, for example, is if there's like a little substitution error. So here, you know, here I have, I'm simulating like a little typo in, in the data where instead of an I, you have a Y. From the point of view of the assembler, it's going to be making up this big path here, but it's going to have these little parts that stick out. This is sometimes called a little tip. The assemblers are quite uh, capable of recognizing this, clip that off, and then hopefully come up with a bigger contig. If you have just sort of the right placement of error, if you have some heterozygosity in your, in your, in your genome, you'll have what are called bubbles, where you have these sort of uh, uh, parallel paths that go from you know, flanking the heterozygosity, flanking the error, back to, back to that uh, homozygous region. 
Again, the assembler is doing an okay job with this. Uh, the reality is, is that many of the assemblers have been written uh, and, and tested against genomes that look something like the human genome, in which case the rate of heterozygosity is about one in a thousand base pairs. If you're studying a plant or a more complicated genome uh, uh, with a higher rate, which is not that uncommon, then the, the reality is, is the algorithms and the data types are really not well suited for those. You should, uh, you should probably send me a note. We can talk about uh, uh, what other options we have. So then really, you know, we can get through, you know, coverage with money, we can get through errors just by recognizing the patterns that are formed. It's really the repeats that are going to really uh, complicate assemblies the, by far the most. And that's, uh, that's you know, that, that's bad news in the sense that repeats are everywhere when we start getting into larger and larger genomes. Something like 50% of mammalian genomes are repetitive. Uh, you know, these, these very large plant genomes that are being sequenced today are, are much, much worse. So the Loblaw pine genome is, 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 is about 24 gigabases. It's being sequenced and assembled as we speak. And it's, it's, and it's kind of thing where, you know, kind of in a tongue-in-cheek way, people have characterized this as the largest study of retrotransposons that have ever been undertaken on the planet. You know, it just makes it extremely complicated to try to piece this all together uh, just because there's so many repeats, which we'll just have a tendency to tangle the graphs. So what can we do about repeats? So uh, in addition to sort of you know, single end or paired end sequencing, I'm sure it's familiar to everyone in the room is there's this notion of uh, mate pair sequencing, where it's going to be pairs of reads where you know they have some distance between them, even though you don't know the actual sequence that's there. So common sort of library preparation is to have mate pair libraries on the order of 2KB, 5KB, or you know, maybe 10KB or larger. And that's great information in terms of recognizing uh, the, uh, or reconstructing across repetitive elements. So again, if a little cartoon diagram is, is, you know, if this is the assembly graph that's constructed by comparing the sequences to each other, if we had some sort of, you know, library that said, you know, this, uh, from the assembly graph that's present, it's not clear if, you know, if it goes A, then, you know, repeat B, repeat C, repeat D, or if it should be C comes before B. But if we had some sort of mate pair information that we could overlay on top of this, what we hope will happen is these unique segments will get linked up in such a way to sort of disambiguate who gets connected to who. That's great information for what's called the scaffolding algorithm. Hopefully be able to put this back into some sort of linear segment, uh, uh, although there may be some sort of internal gaps along the way where just couldn't quite figure out all the repeats that were present. So what we hope for is that, you know, we'll run an assembler, we'll be able to build these big scaffolds, maybe overlay it with other information to build up something like linkage groups or maybe even entire chromosomes. A uh, really popular way to visualize this, this is called a circos plot. This is the circos plot I made for the lotus flower genome that we published in genome uh, biology a few months ago. You know, on the outside ring we have the linkage groups that is actually composed of uh, multiple scaffolds put together. Of course, though, you know, getting to the assembly point is just sort of step one in a, you know, in a genome project. Then we're going to want to try to, you know, make, you know, try to do some validation that we have a reasonable assembly. Then we're going to do all this downstream analysis to analyze it, to uh, annotate, re uh, uh, annotate uh, genes, you know, look at expression levels, so forth. And then it's a long road ahead of you to hopefully get to that happy state of publishing. Okay, so that was kind of the, you know, high-level tour of what's going on. Let's talk a little bit in more detail about the available software packages. So today, there's, there's probably, I don't know, on the order of two dozen genome assemblers that are sort of actively maintained. And it's really hard to know, like, what's a good assembler, what's a bad assembler, what should I be using? You know, it, 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 we went through this, at least, we're probably in the middle of, like, maybe the third or fourth major transition. So, Kind of the early days of assembly were all dominated by like FRAP, those types of algorithms. Then around 2000, there was a rise of sort of whole genome shotgun assemblers really designed for large genomes. There was the Solera assembler. Uh, there's one from the Broad called the uh, uh, Arachne. There is uh, uh, a few other you know, large scale assemblers, all really driven by Sanger data. Then there was another number of assemblers that were really optimized for 454 data. There were assemblers that were optimized for the teeny tiny Illumina reads when they first came out. The Velvet is probably the most familiar to those. And then you know, today it's like 2013, what are we going to do with all of these data? How are we going to assemble them? So it's, you know, the, the, because the underlying biotechnology has been changing so fast, it's really hard to you know, stay abreast of, of, of what is, what's kind of really the state of the art. So fortunately though, we don't have to go into this blind. There's been uh, actually a few major studies 
you know, that have been trying to benchmark all these assemblers, tell you, you know, give you some guidance on what are the best practices. Uh, the first sort of major project was in 2011 called the Assemblathon 1. And there the, the scenario was they took a, a genome that was about 100 megabase pairs. It was a simulated genome with simulated data, which has its own sort of trade-offs. It was, it was great in the sense that we could exactly uh, measure how well the assemblers did. But of course, it's only as good as the simulation is. Uh, in Assemblathon 2, which was published uh, a few months ago, uh, we looked at three vertebrate genomes. Uh, there was, a, let's see, a snake, a fish, and a snake, a fish, and a, what was the third genome? Anybody remember? Shoot, I forgot. So there's three vertebrate genomes, each about a gigabase in size. Uh, there that we were presented with real data that we went after uh, trying to assemble it. Uh, the, the, the challenge there was then trying to assess, you know, who did better. You know, we just did these, we did all these different assemblies. There was uh, pretty big differences in some cases over, you know, how it was put together. Oh, and a parrot. And it was in a parrot, and it was, it was just very hard to assess, you know, uh, the accuracy there. So what the technique that they did for that is they did uh, finished back sequencing of a few regions. They did, they held back some additional uh, sequencing data that they could use to sort of validate against. They looked at sort of what was the gene content there, you know, did it match all the sort of expected genes we hoped to have? Did it, uh, 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 they did some transcriptome analysis, did it have all the genes they expected? So they kind of, you know, they, used every, they did optical mapping. They did all the sort of technologies that you could ever hope to have to try to assess these genomes. Although we didn't have, you know, the, the truth in the same way that we did for the Assemblathon one. So I encourage you, if, you know, if you're interested in genome assembly, you have a project, I, I encourage you to sort of study these papers in detail to learn about their best practices. But let me just give you a, a couple of the highlights. So the highlight number one was none of the assemblies, none, none of the assemblers got a perfect result. They all had different strengths and weaknesses. They all got different regions uh, correct or, or incorrect. So what I'm showing here is, is uh, kind of, uh, one of the one of the many figures from the Assemblathon, paper, Assemblathon 1 paper where there was uh, an evaluation over the simulated genome. You know, what, what fraction of it was assembled correctly? Which fraction of it was assembled incorrectly? So here's the result from the Broad. Here's the result from JGI. Here's the result I submitted. You know, similar kind of story for the other assemblers. And, they, and it's kind of interesting that, you know, every assembler, you know, got certain parts right because those are easy. All the assemblers, you know, got other parts wrong just because they were more complicated. So the way that they did kind of the final analysis, the final ranking for this was, was kind of like the Olympics, right? No one got it perfect. It was hard to assess, you know, which was really better in all categories. So they, they evaluated it in something like 10 different categories ranging from just sort of connectivity to the number of structural variations there were, number of small scale mistakes there were, other sort of mistakes, representation over the gene content. And then, you know, in each category you got, you know, you either got first place, second place, third place, fourth place in each of the categories. And then that became some score. And then there was this final ranking of, 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 uh, of how the different assemblers uh, performed according to that score. So the two assemblers that really stood out from this were uh, an assembler called Soap De Novo from BGI and a second assembler called um, uh, All Pass uh, from the Broad Institute. Uh, the next one was an assembler called SGA from uh, Sanger Institute, my submission using the Solar assembler and then many, many other assemblers along the way. This, this table is actually much longer um, when they consider all the assemblers that are present. So from this, my interpretation is, is, is sort of uh, uh, all pass and soaped and over were, were actually basically indistinguishable in terms of their performance. However, all pass has the major advantage that it's very, very straightforward to run. There's very few parameters that you yourself have to set. The, uh, part of the algorithm is to inspect the data to try to infer, you know, what is your coverage level, what's the error rate, all these things. It'll try to discover that for you so you don't have to uh, manually adjust a million different parameters. In contrast, you can, so this, you know, clearly you can get a good assembly out of Soap De Novo, but none of that is, is sort of easy or automated. It's up to you as the operator to control a thousand different parameters. In fact, when I try to assemble these data using Soap De Novo, I don't get anything that resembles that. I don't know, the, the people at the BGI must have some um, uh, very clever ways to be able to figure out what the parameter is. So as a result of sort of this analysis, Assemblathon 2, lots of sort of internal testing I do here, uh, lots of other projects I've worked on, my, my really strong recommendation, if you're going into a new genome, you want to know what should I use today, my very, very strong recommendation is use all pass. It works really well 
uh, you're going to get a very good assembly um, uh, without a lot of sort of um, uh, hand uh, tuning. The one sort of caveat is that, of that is, is there's some new tech. So I'll pass, you have to have the sort of right sort of Illumina sequencing for you to, to use it. If you have access to some of the emerging single molecule technologies, they're becoming extremely interesting. We'll see an example in a second. In which case, I'll pass nor soap de novo are compatible. Uh, really, the only assembler you can use today is this layer assembler. And we'll see that in a minute. So I'm going to give you just a five minute uh, description of how I'll pass works, just so you have some familiarity with it. So of course, the ultimate goal is to go from you know, unassembled reads into some major assembly. But there's a couple of uh, sort of landmarks along the way, this, along the path. So the first sort of major milestone is to be able to build up those initial contigs, with, which in the parlance of all paths are called your unipaths. So we're going to go from you know, unassembled reads into unipaths using that sort of Dickens strategy, and then into your complete uh, scaffold assembly. And then if we can just add a next layer of detail, before we, we're going to build up those unipaths, there's a lot of work to sort of clean up your data, to do on-the-fly error correction, to sort of merge the data to make it you know, better in different ways. Once we have the unipass, those initial contigs built, there's a lot of uh, phases to build up uh, different scaffold, to build scaffolds, find mistakes, fix them up, you know, and so forth, until we have the final output from the assembler. The total sort of number of steps is around, I don't know, maybe 250 phases. So it's not something that you know, is going to run in five minutes. It's just going to take time to go through all these steps. But that's, you know, that's OK. I'm, I'm willing to wait. You know, as long as I'm pretty sure I'm going to get a good result, I'm willing to wait a little bit longer to get there. So the one sort of uh, challenge, if you will, for using all pass is that there's a very specific requirement on the type of data that you, that you give it. Uh, you, in, in, in particular, you have to have at least two libraries. This is it's really fundamental to the algorithm. You have to have it. One of the libraries has to be uh, what's called an overlapping uh, pairs fragment library, and one of them has to be a jumping library. So an overlapping pairs uh, fragment library is if you're doing, say, you know, Illumina, HiSeq, run 100 base pair reads, we're going to do the sequencing from 180 base pair fragments such that the very ends of the reads, we hope, will overlap. At first, this seems like a, a, a sort of silly thing to do, right? We've spent all this money to get all this coverage. Now we're going to build in redundancy up front. So you know, it, it, it's, it, from that point of view, it seems a little bit wasteful. But what it, what it does is, is, because the pairs overlap, we can take those individual fragments that are each, or individual reads, each about 100 base pairs long. We can do a little pre-assembly of them to turn them into 180 base pair reads, which is actually uh, a substantial improvement when we go to build up the sort of De Bruin graph. Instead of, instead of being restricted to using k-mirrors that are like, you know, at most 100 base pairs long, now we have reads that are 180 base pairs long. We can use much longer k-mers, get across much longer repeats. So uh, I, I, that's a really good thing to do uh, in, in my mind. It was very clever of them to recognize that we could, uh, we could generate those data. The other requirement is some sort of jumping library. So this is, so this is that protocol. We're going to take you know, molecules that are, say, 3 or 5 kb long. We're going to circularize them and then do parallel sequencing across that junction point to, to, ge to generate so-called mate pair reads. So even though, the, at, from the point of view of the sequencing, those reads are right next to each other. But with respect to the original genome, they're going to be like 2 or 5 kb apart. <clears throat> so uh, that, and those data are used to do all the scaffolding to actually put together, uh, 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 to resolve repeats, re resolve other conflicts. So the sort of recommended strategy, you know, if you can do it, is something like 45x coverage from the fragment library, uh, 45x coverage from you know, uh, one of your jumping libraries. If you want to get, really big, big, get really big scaffolds, you, you really need larger uh, jumping libraries. That's what they recommend, you know, lighter coverage of, say, a 6KB library. If you, can, if, you can, you know, if you can find someone that can make the libraries, of, you know, a very large library, like a 40KB library, is extremely useful for putting together you know, very, very big scaffolds. Unfortunately, those, unfortunately, though, these are very expensive to come by. It's really only the bro that ever makes them any sort of routine way, but uh, 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 very helpful if you can get them. The, but sort of all added up, we should, we're targeting right around 100x coverage over this mixture of libraries. OK, so the first thing that it does is given all these data, it's going to do some sort of pre-assembly error correction. So if we, if, we, if we had a crystal ball and we knew how the reads actually came from the genome, 
errors would be very easy to correct in the sense that you know, here's this layout of all these short reads. Uh, here's this, you know, most, over most of the reads, there's no conflicts, but then we're just going to have these isolated columns where you know, one base will be different than the rest of the, uh, rest of the column. That's you know, most likely just some sort of sequencing error. Now, of course, though, you know, to do this requires some crystal ball to know the layout of the reads with respect to the original genome. That's what we're trying to build up. So the, the sort of uh, uh, clever approach that they do uh, to do error correction is to use uh, a sort of a word analysis of the unassembled reads. These are called k-mers to find reads that share some same some some short k-mer. Like you know, every read here has g a t t a c a. Every read has Gattaca, 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 Gattaca. And if the if the k-mer is sufficiently long, you actually have pretty good confidence that actually all those reads come from the same spot in the genome. And then they just look a few base pairs away from that to say, aha. You know, inside of this camera, they're all exactly the same, but aha, here's an error flanking that just a few bases away. This can make, do the error correction, fix that up for you. So now that we have, actually that, that pr procedure is actually extremely effective with Illumina data uh, dominated by, uh, you know, a, a, a occasional substitution error. So now that we have more or less perfect data, we can go ahead and try to take those overlapping pairs and merge them together. You know, just, it tries to do an overlap there. If necessary, it'll look for a third read to sort of confirm that in case there's some sort of tandem repeat right at the end there. Um, that, that's built into the algorithm. And then exactly like we saw with that sort of uh, uh, Dickens graph, we're gonna, then we're gonna take these merged together pairs. It's gonna build a De Bruin graph. By default, it uses 96 base pair k-mers. So it'll take all the 96 base pair k-mers across the read, build up the De Bruin graph from that. That'll form your initial set of unipaths. And then given those unipaths, it's going to look at the coverage of them, try to identify what are the unique segments. It's going to pick the best unipaths in terms of the, they, they are the longest and also look unique. Use the mate pairs to see what's flanking across there and then try to, fix, and try to patch that up into initial scaffolds. Then there's several rounds of revision to build up you know, the best uh, uh, scaffolds that it possibly can. So just to kind of give you an overview of what you, uh, you, know, what you hope to expect, on the y-axis here, we have our contig sizes. On the, on the x-axis, we have our scaffold sizes. This is a map of you know, 19 or so vertebrate genomes that have been assembled with all paths. The, the, the Chinese lotus flower that I mentioned before was about 850 megabase pairs. Our contig N50 was about 30 KB. Our scaffold N50 was about 5 KB. So you know, I've had personal experience being right here in the middle of this map. Um, that was you know, a really good assembly. I was really, really pleased with that. To get these monster, you know, very large, you know, tens of megabase scaffolds, you absolutely have to have that big FOSMA library, those big 40K jumps, to be able to jump over all the repeats in your, in your, in your genome. <clears throat> okay, I'm just gonna spend a couple minutes uh, quickly going over a Solar Assembler. So the all pass is built into the discovery environment. That's what our hands-on exercise is gonna do. The Solar Assembler is sort of more at the research frontier of what is gonna be, hopefully, in the not too distant future. So the way the Solar Assembler works is, is conceptually very similar to what I just described with all paths, where there's some, from unassembled reads, there's error correction, there's you know, building up initial contigs, building up uh, scaffolds. The one sort of major change is rather than taking reads and then chopping them up into k-mers, it's just gonna compare one full length read to another. This is called an overlap graph. It's, uh, there's some sort of technical differences I'm, I wasn't gonna describe today. The main sort of virtue of this is that it's totally compatible with long read sequencing. So now that there's some instruments and some technologies available to generate reads that are not you know, 100 base pairs long, but tens of thousands of base pairs long, it becomes crazy to take a read that's 10,000 base pairs long and then chop it up into like 50 base pair fragments. That's just, it's just a kind of a crazy thing to do. So it, the Solar Assembler has this strength that it's able to take these full 10,000 base pair reads, compare them to each other, assemble them, de novo. So today there's, there's three techno well, two and a half technologies that are available uh, for doing long read sequencing. The first is, is from the company Pacific Biosciences. They have an instrument called the PECBIO RS2. Uh, here at Cold Spring Harbor, we have, uh, actually have two of these instruments. Here's the kind of relink distribution from them. Uh, notice the scale, and this plot goes from zero to 25,000 base pairs. The longest read I've ever seen is about 45,000 base pairs from this instrument, you know, getting these really monster reads that come off of them. 
Of course, not, you, know, you want all the reads to be long, but instead you're going to get this distribution where, you know, in reality, you know, you're going to get many that are 1,000, 2,000, 3,000. Today, using kind of the bleeding edge uh, reagents and size selection, uh, the best library I've ever seen was about 10,000 base pairs on average. So that was a really good library. That was uh, really useful for assembly. The next sort of long read technology is, actu is actually a very clever use of Illumina technology. So it's, you know, the sequencing itself actually takes place on a high seq 2500 uh, using uh, a technology called molecular sequencing. So the idea for molecular sequencing is, you know, we're going to extract, you know, from cells, extract DNA. We're going to shear them not into like a, you know, a short fragment library, but we're going to shear it down into like a 10 KB segment. Uh, so then, in, you know, in a, in a test tube, we'll have, you know, our, our library of 10 KB molecules. Those then that get diluted down th using some microfluidics device into, like, teeny tiny little wells, where in each well, we're only going to have a small number, like 10 of these big 10 KB fragments. Then from the molecular technology, they have a way inside of each of these little wells to take each of those 10 KB molecules, uh, fragment it down into shorter molecules, amplify it, attach barcodes, so then you, know, then you pool them all together. And then in your pool, you have all these little fragments, all these short molecules, but they've been tagged from which 10 KB molecule they came from. So after you do the sequencing, you get all these barcoded reads. You can go ahead and do like a little pre-assembly to reconstruct those original 10 KB molecules. So here's their marketing version of, you know, of a read length distribution that you get from this. It lags behind the PacBio uh, data. And the data that I've seen, you know, of the real data I've seen, the actual, we didn't have this little hump here at 6 KB. You know, we had kind of this uh, exponential decay, the average of which was about 2 KB. You know, it's good data. It's much better than just, you know, straight Illumina data. Uh, but my interpretation of this is they're still trying to optimize the microfluidics and the barcoding and everything to make this work. Uh, so this technology was announced about a year ago. At that time, they said in six months, It'll be available for, uh, as a kit. It is not available as a kit today. I have no uh, updates on when the kit it will be available, if ever. The third sort of long read technology, you guys probably you know, heard all the buzz about it, is this uh, nanopore sequencer from this company, Axor Nanopore. Uh, it was announced at this big meeting called AGBT about uh, coming up on two years ago. Then they went into this dark period where there was no information about what was going on with them. And then a couple weeks ago, they announced this early access program where they're finally going to have these little thumb-sized devices. Uh, if you're interested, they're, they're accepting applications. I mean, I don't work for them, but they're accepting applications today where you can apply to get early access to one of these little thumb, uh, thumb drives. The specs for them are totally unknown. It's speculated that the throughput is on the order of like 100 megabases per hour, but no one really knows what it's going to be. At AGBT, they claim that they could sequence up to 50,000 base pairs. I don't know. I haven't seen the data. I have no idea you know, what the distribution is going to look like. My suspicion is it's going to look you know, in the same way as PacBio, where there's going to be, you know, maybe you'll have some 50 KB molecules, but it's going to be across a distribution. But I have no idea what it actually looks like. So given these you know, very long reads, you know, we want to try to make use of them for assembly. The, data, the best data I have actually seen has come from the PacBio RS uh, instruments. Uh, it's great in the sense that you get long reads, but, it's, but in, by other metrics, it lags behind, say, Illumina sequencing. right? So but in terms of throughput, it's much lower. And in particular, in terms of accuracy, it's far, far behind. Uh, the raw base call accuracy is far behind the Illumina uh, sequencing. The good news is, is we, can, we don't have to use data in isolation. And we've developed some algorithms that can take combinations of PacBio data and Illumina data and then uh, uh, combine them together in order to do error correction of the PacBio reads. We're getting to the point where we can more or less cancel out all the errors that are present in the data. This is the pipeline that we published about a year ago in Nature Biotech. We have a, we have a revi revised version of this pipeline uh, that's currently available at GitHub today. If you're interested to use it, let me know. I'll, put you in touch with them. So let me kind of sh show you uh, some of the results that we're getting from this. <clears throat> so we d we've been doing an experiment in, in collaboration with Dick McCombie and Doreen here at, at Cold Spring Harbor, where we have done a, a, you know, standard best practice all-pass sequencing of uh, the about 400 mega base pair Nippon Berry uh, rice genome, uh, running it through all-pass with, with a, you know, the fragment library, a 2KB library, a 5KB library. Uh, the Contig M50 that results from this is just shy of 20 KB. So this, you know, it's a good assembly. Uh, we've been doing multiple strains of rice using this recipe. 
we hope that indeed they're all going to be publishable. In addition to this, we have done quite a bit of pack biosequencing. So the way to read this graph is, you know, of the reads that are 1,000 base pairs or longer, we have just shy of 18x. Of 2,000 or longer, we have about 13x. Of 5,000 base pairs or longer, we have, what is this, uh, 4 or 5x or so. So we have, you know, quite a bit of this extra long read data. Using the algorithm that we published a year ago, it improves the assembly by about a factor of, uh, but not quite three. We were, we were pretty happy with that. But really, the, the star is with the new algorithm, refined algorithm, available in GitHub today, we've pushed up the assembly you know, by a factor of eight. So now, instead of having you know, relatively short contigs, we have much bigger contigs to work with. Much, uh, as a result from this, you know, genes tend to be assembled in the individual contigs, promoter sequences, you know, flanking sequences. The only thing that we're really missing from these contigs is if there's like very big, repetitive, transposable elements, you know, there's still some ambiguity about how those get assembled, because our uh, we just don't have quite enough uh, long reads yet. OK, so just to kind of summarize, assembly quality depends on, number one, coverage. If you have low coverage, your project is doomed. Spend more money, get deeper sequencing so that you're not doomed. And then the number kind of two and number three are, are very closely intertwined, so repeat composition and read length. So if you have you know, longer and longer reads, we're going to be able to assemble across uh, 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 more of the repeats that are present. Error rates are problematic. If the errors are random, we have some good algorithms to deal with them. If the errors are sort of systematic, you know, barcoding issues or whatnot, then it's going to be really hard to deal with them. The actual process is, is very hierarchical. We're going to go from reads, you know, using that sort of Dickens strategy, build up some initial contigs, overlay with mate pairs to build up scaffolds, and then if we have sort of other, other mapping information, we hope to be able to build up entire chromosomes. My strong recommendation Today is if you, know, you have a big genome, uh, it's expensive to do the single molecule sequencing, so I, I strongly encourage you to, do, to use the all-pass recipe using the all-pass assembler. If you have access to it and you can afford it and you know, things are, are going well, you know, today the longest reads I've ever seen have been using PAC bio. If you're, if you're sequencing like a few megabase pair uh, microbe, they have an algorithm called HGAP that's like really highly tuned to use just PAC bio data. If, you, if it's a bigger genome or it's a combination of data, then Solar Assembler is your best approach. And then I strongly encourage you guys to check out the Assemblathon papers to draw your own conclusions over uh, which assemblers to use. OK, so that was my sort of whirlwind tour through the available technologies. Before we kind of transition, are there any questions? Yes? What are they for in the So for the, the assembled sequences, so the sequencing for Molecular is the base sequencing is the like, high seq 2500, which is like less than 1%. But then we're doing this little assembly of it where you know, the, uh, we're going to take multiple of these short reads, do a pre-assembly of that, which has a tendency to like, virtually cancel out all the errors of the data. So the, from the data I've seen, the, the reads are a few thousand base pairs. They're basically error-free you know, after this process. Uh, that has really nice advantages, not only for assembly, but for like, haplotype phasing and other things. Yes. And, uh, the double monoploid for zygotes was easy. It was done by the Chinese, maybe they did <laughs> with uh, Subdenova, but they, they had the zygotes clone sequence. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, how well do uh, the, the present day assemblers deal with uh, highly heterozygous genes? Not very well. <laughs> <laughs> ah. Sure. So the so the question, the comment was, uh, you know, he has experience working with in potato. The homozygous version of it assembled really well. The heterozygous version of it assembled poorly a few years ago. He asked me, you know, what's kind of the state of the art? And the conclusion is, it still stinks. So the assemblers have really been designed around the human genome, which has this about one in a thousand, very very low uh, percent of heterozygosity. Uh, the people are starting to transition to more complicated genomes. Uh, I've had I've had. Uh, kind of a few projects just scratching the surface on it, but it's, it's a hard problem, right? So what happens is, because of the heterozygosity, the genome tends, it's not, it's, it's like, you know, it's, it's taking, a, uh, taking a tale of two cities and then another copy of, tale, of tale of two cities that has mistakes along the way, scrambling up all the data, and then as a result, with, if everything is perfect, you get this nice bubble structure, encoding all the heterozygosity. 
In reality, though, there's these bubbles, but then there's repeats, so it gets tangled, and then there's errors, so then it gets more fragmented. It's just really hard to work with from short reads. About the most successful talk and presentation I've ever seen about dealing with heterozygosity, there was a really, actually, it was at Genome Informatics here a couple weeks ago from Jason Chin at PacBio, where they're using their extra long reads and all their, you know, at very, very deep coverage. Uh, and they were assembling, let's see, uh, yeast and Arabidopsis that was heterozygous, and then you get, you get this like, really nice uh, assembly where you actually get the nice bubbles that you expect representing the, you know, the two haplotypes that are correctly assembled. So I, I, think that's, I think you've exactly identified the research frontier. That's a problem that I'm really interested to work on. Uh, so if you have data of that type, please contact me after. We can talk about what the options are. Uh, so there's three online questions. Oh, sure. <laughs> okay, so first question is, what's the best assembler from ion torrent? Yeah, that's a, that's a tough question. So uh, we have an ion torrent here at Cold Spring Harbor. It is not widely used because it has, uh, uh, well, number one, it's, 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 it's a different protocol, so it's complicated in the sense that we have this really streamlined protocol for Illumina. We're not so streamlined for ion torrent. It also, it, as a result, I have very limited experience working with the data. Uh, my, I do have experience working with 454 uh, you know, from a few years ago, in which case I extensively use the Solera assembler. That's probably what I would start with today. You just have to be very careful to tune for you know, the, the homopolymer errors that are present in the data. Another question is, what's the best way to validate two different assemblies, both from the Solera assembler, um, but producing different scaffolds? <laughs> Uh, it, it, it depends a little bit on the goals of the project. If it's, if it's sort of a you know, gene finding project, then that, I would recommend a pipeline called Kegma that I'm going to uh, walk through in a minute. If you're looking to sort of get the, you know, the best connectivity, you can rank them by you know, uh, 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 sort of connectivity metrics like contig or scaffold N50 size. If he waits about uh, realistically six weeks, my student is uh, finishing up a manuscript this, the, talking about a new algorithm to combine multiple assemblies into a consensus approach that would exactly address that. Uh, another one is how do you differentiate between true errors and single nucleotide polymorphisms? Ah, it's a, it's a statistical argument. So at low coverage, this is really hard to do. So if you see, you know, you have a stack of 10 reads and you know, two of them differ from the rest of them. Well, it could be the case that this is either sequencing error or heterozygosity. It's sort of like, you know, you flip a coin 10 times, you only see two heads. It's not that surprising. If, on the other hand, you flip a coin 100 times and you only see two heads, that's almost certainly a sequencing error in the data. You know, because the probability of that is, you know, you're much better off winning the lottery and getting struck by lightning in the same day. Okay, I think that's it for our online questions for now. Um, I'd love to have Yeah. Oh, okay, super, super, super. Okay, so the next part I was going to go over is the uh, tutorial with iPlant. So normally, so I teach you know, these sort of technologies a lot. So normally I would start with, well, let's go to this FTP site, run all these complicated commands. But today we will not be doing any of those things because we're going to be able to use a discovery environment to do this in a very friendly, easy to use way. So uh, I'm going to be, I'm going to be, so the, the reality of assembly is that it's not a, you know, a real-time activity. To do you know, a gigabase genome, you're talking about days of compute. Even like a microbe is going to be you know, many minutes to hours. So what I'm, my, what my strategy for you know, this part is we're going to do it a little bit like a cooking show. I'm going to show you how I'm going to prepare the ingredients, prepare the assemblies. I'm going to push go, but then I'm going to switch to the other oven that has the results already for you. So just bear with me. I'm going to be doing you know, kind of playing this game a little bit. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to go to the discovery environment. Oh, let me get rid of this. Maybe make this a little bit bigger. So that's First thing I do is go to the discovery environment. I have to look up my password. Hopefully it'll let me in. It did not.
Okay, very good. So if, if, if you guys are not familiar with it, there's this awesome software package called 1Password that is like a password manager. So on my laptop where I do most of my work, I can click a button and it'll fill in passwords for me. But since I'm on a different computer, I had to type it in by hand, which I never do. Okay, so here I am inside the discovery environment. Uh, as uh, Jason K gave you a little bit of tour, kind of the major uh, 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 buttons that are available is you know, one for data, uh, one for you know, the available apps, one for analyses. So you know, I'm gonna, in, in, the, in, the, in the interest of full disclosure, I'm gonna be working in kind of the analysis oven, but I'm gonna be pulling my results out of the gold oven where all the steps are done. Just in the interest of full disclosure, you know, if, if, if uh, hopefully you'll be able to see the process uh, you know, happen, even though I'm gonna be kind of switching back and forth between these two directories. Yes, I can. I'm gonna make this a little bigger. Okay. So that's 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 what I'm gonna be doing. So let me switch back to the slide deck so we have a little context about what what's gonna happen. So the, you know the nice thing about the discovery environment is it's a very graphical environment. There's a you know this big catalog of tools. You don't have to install stuff. In addition, on the back end of this, there's this enormous cluster. Uh, well, there's a couple of clusters at uh, in Texas. There's another one in Arizona. They have very, very big memory servers available, like terabytes of RAM available. So you know, we have some really heavy duty horsepower uh, uh, accessible through this web interface. So the process for assembling a genome uh, goes, what goes, will go something like this. Where did I put, yeah, will go something like this. So of course we have to load our data into the system. Uh, the reality of this is this could take you know, a few minutes or it could take literally months depending on the bandwidth of your institution. This is the, it's not an iPlant thing, it's a, it's a U thing, right? If you're uploading over you know, your Wi-Fi, over your cable modem, and you have a terabyte of data to move, that's gonna just take, the reality is that's gonna take a very, very long time to do. Uh, if, if, if you're at, a, if you're at a, like a major research institution, you're probably on this thing called Internet 2, which has very high uh, internet connectivity on the orders of you know, many tens of gigab gigabytes per second can be transferred across this link. Here at Cold Spring Harbor, we have a one gigabit per second connection, which is pretty good, but uh, 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 you know, it's, it's still gonna be a bottleneck. It's not iPlan's fault, it's your fault for not spending more money to get a faster internet connection. So I'm gonna kind of walk you through how to upload reads. Now, what, what, what many people do, and yeah, I'm, I'm guilty of this all the time, is once my data are there, I like to push go on the assembler. I like to get, let that go and launch and run just because I'm like eager to see what's going on there. But it, it, it happens with every single project, so it might as well be, you know, you might as well, before you launch the assembly, let's do some assessment of your data, try to see what's going on there, rather than just being kind of gonzo about what's gonna, uh, uh, the result. And then once we have an assembly, you know, we're gonna talk a little bit about, you know, the, the assessment process. Uh, I'm gonna be talking primarily about this nice package called Kegma, which tries to evaluate the gene content that, that is present there. If you want to really know more about how you can assess a de novo assembly, I really encourage you to check out the AssembleFound 2 paper where they've talked about every technology and metric under the sun uh, to be able to make sense of that. Now here I have this really nice you know, waterfall from A to B to C to D, but in reality there's feedback loops all the way, or, all the way down the waterfall. You know, if at the level of assessment you realize your coverage is too low or there's quality issues, you know, you're gonna have to go back to do more sequencing. From the assembly standpoint, if it, if it comes out bad, there's gonna be a lot of detective work to try to figure out why that is. That'll really focus on the, on the assessment, perhaps even more sequencing. And then at the level of, of assembly, you know, just like we heard from the person sort of calling in, it's pretty common to launch multiple assemblies of the same data to try to get a sense of, you know, are the parameters I'm using, are they correct, are they robust, what are the trade-offs involved there? So there's gonna be kind of the spirals all the way back and forth across the waterfall. So the first step is gonna to be to upload some reads. Like I said, it's entirely your fault if it's slow. <laughs> I'm teasing. Uh, because there's an inside the discovery environment, there's uh, various mechanisms to be able to transfer very large data sets. Uh, inside the browser, there's, a, there's an easy sort of, you know, click your way through and, but the reality is, is that's good for sort of really small amounts of data. If you have like on the order of, I don't know, a few megabytes to maybe hundreds of megabytes, that's appropriate. Then there's a bulk, older, bulk 
uploader that's available for you know a few gigabytes. But if you have you know hundreds and hundreds of gigabytes, what I would encourage you to do is write to uh, uh, write to the folks at iPlant, tell them about this. What they're going to do is direct you through the process of installing what's called the iRods uh, transport system, which is a really uh, uh, a protocol that's really high throughput for transferring huge amounts of data around. So I think I'm going to, in the interest of time, I'm going to skip over the live demo of me clicking on a website to upload data. OK, so then once we have our, our data available, we're going to want to do some sort of you know, an initial sort of quality screen of the data. The tool I really like for this is a, is a package called uh, FastQC. So let me, let me give you an actual live demo, launching it, and then we'll go in the other oven to pull out you know, what the results of that uh, analysis look like. So, so just to kind of review, you know, if I wanted to do a real analysis, I would probably do you know, one of these upload buttons to try to upload data into this uh, uh, discovery environment. In the interest of time, though, what I'm going to do is in the community data store, I'm going to expand that. And then in iPant, iPlant Collaborative, expand that. And then in, oh, excuse me, in, uh, I lost my data. Oh, in example data, we're going to expand inside of that. Then there's this all pass data, expand inside of that. Then there's this folder called Roto, which is short for Rhodiobacter, which is a microbial genome. It's about five megabases. It was one of the genomes that was studied uh, in part of something called the Gage Project, where there was a, is kind of complementary to the Assemblathon, where they were evaluating different assemblers, but on real data, uh, and those data are available here. So the first observations, so can I make this a little bigger? So the first observations is there's four files, each about 200 megabases big. There's kind of two sets of files. There's the fragment files. I'm just, I'm just going to have to tell you, you know, from the, from the sequencing core, this is, 100, this is the first read and second read from a 180 base pair uh, fragment library. This is the first read and a second read from a, a 3.5 KB jump library from this microbe. So if I was interested to run that FASTQ program on these data, what I'm going to do is go click on the Apps button. That's going to bring up this menu. Now there's, there's literally hundreds of different applications in here. There's a, you know, there's a, there's a hierarchical menu to try to organize this. But actually what I'm going to do here is I'm going to cheat. I'm just going to type in FASTQC. You know, that's going to scan through all the tools that are available. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to run this one here that has the, you know, the couple stars associated with it. Click on it. That's going to bring up this input box. And the really, what I'm going to do is just click on Select Input Data. I'm going to switch back to the data view. Oh, I need to. I'm running out of screen real estate here just because I have all the windows maximized. So what I'm going to do is grab this like frag1 fastq, drop it in that box. It'll automatically know how to copy and paste that path there. Then there's some options here, but I'm not interested in those options. The uh, defaults are fine. Click launch analysis. Boom. Uh, yep. So you know, get this little pop-up that says it's successfully launched. If I go to this notification box, we'll see that my job was submitted. Now, it, it doesn't seem at all impressive what I just did. But in reality, what happened is, is you know, I, using this web interface, I just told this enormous uh, computer in Texas you know, where these other data live. Then in this big uh, uh, queuing system, I just said, I want you to run this you know, program that I selected on those data. The results will then get put into my analysis directory in my home directory. So fa that FASTQ program works one file at a time. So to evaluate all your data, you would run this you know, four times on each of the four files that are available. So if I, swip, if I switch now to the other oven, here's the results of that that had just completed. Probably the easiest way to look at the data is to grab uh, the FASTQ uh, zip file. You know, it's, it's just a, it's a binary file. That was a mistake. I'm going to click on the download button. It's a, it's, a, it's a teeny tiny file, so I'm just going to use the simple downloader. And then hopefully in about a second, we'll be able to grab this and take a look at it. Uh, I lost it. it is. Here we go. So 
So here's the results, and here's the main file that's in here. Okay, so the output from that is a HTML file that has a variety of sequencing metrics available. So the first thing it you know, tells you about is you know, the number of reads that were present, sequence length, overall GC content. The next thing that I really like to look at is to look at this plot here. Make it a little bit smaller so it'll fit. So what, the, so what this has done is, is for over all the data, it's tried to summarize what is the quality value at each base. So I think this is a, the quality value is a familiar concept. Quality values typically go from 0 to 40. Uh, high numbers are good. We have a lot of confidence in our data. Low numbers are bad in the sense that, ooh, you know, the probability of error uh, is really high. This is, unfortunately, this is a pretty typical profile where the quality starts very high and then drops off. I think it's this uh, uh, blue line. Uh, no, it's this red line here that has the average. Uh, so the, my interpretation of this data are the first, I don't know, 50, 60 bases are really high quality. But then below t quality value of 20 is when it starts to become really problematic. If you're using uh, Solar Assembler, SOAP, Abyss, um, Velvet, any other, you know, most assemblers, what I would do with, I would do with this is, is I would tell you to do some trimming of your data. Now the good thing about all passes is it's going to, internally it's going to make similar metrics of your data and it'll do its own internal trimming. But if you're giving, if you're not using the all pass, you have to do this yourself. In the discovery environment, there's something called the, the Fast X Toolkit. And one of the things it can do is trim your data. You can tell it to trim by quality value. You can tell it to trim by you know, a, a, a fixed number of bases or so forth. But you want to get rid of this really, uh, really er erroneous data. It'll really confuse your results. Other things I like to look at, so this is you know, a profile of the quality scores per read. So kind of the average read uh, is good. You know, is, is out here, has a quality score of something like uh, 34, which is very high. But then there's also this big collection of data that has very, very poor quality. So this, these data are actually a few years old. I think there was like a problem with the run. If I, if I showed this to our sequencing core here, I think I could probably get them to do some new, to redo the sequencing because there's this big collection of data that was problematic. So that's a nice inspection of your data to see what's going on there. <clears throat> Other things that I like to see is, so this is a profile of the fraction of bases that are ACGT. What you want to see is that these curves are consistent with each other. Right, because we don't expect like, you know, the beginning of a read to have higher or lower GC than the end of the read. We want this to be a flat profile. Because we have this little pickup here what is in the black, which is what, the G, this starts to make me nervous that there is some sort of you know, weird sequencing phenomenon going on there that might need to be addressed. Uh, again, we see, you know, overall, we see the, the GC content tends to pick up a little bit. This, in reality, that's not so bad. This gives you kind of the overall profile. Now, Illumina sequencing has a well-known uh, bias with very high and very low GC content. The coverage will get reduced. So this is kind of a plot of this. The overall GC is, is pretty high. It's about 60, 65%. Uh, and as a result of this, um, uh, we, we are probably missing some of the real data at the very high end of, of this genome. And, and uh, Rhodiobacter is known to have a high GC content, so that can be a problem. Oh. If you see that this profile is not smooth, if you see another hump, your data are contaminated by another species. So I have seen this on several projects where you know, we thought we were sequencing you know, Rhodobacter, but then there's this like, weird other hump there. There was something else in your data. You know, it's, it's kind of like the most coarse grain uh, metagenomics analysis you can do just to look at GC content. But you'd be surprised at how effective you can uh, recognize problems in that way. Uh, there's no big problems with ends in these data. You know, they're all 100 base pairs long, so it's uniform length. The sequence duplication can be a really telling phenomenon. You know, so there's this kind of well-known problem that sometimes, you know, instead of just getting one uh, read from a given molecule, there's going to be multiple reads from the sort of original template molecule. That throws off all the coverage statistics. So if you see that there's a high level of, of duplication level, so the way to read this is, is you know, compared to the reads that occur once, there's only a few percent that are occur twice or three times. This is actually a really clean library. I've seen terrible libraries where like every read gets duplicated, and that's you know something has gone awry. You probably have too high of cluster density when you did the loading. Uh, and then here's an analysis of like camers that occur to that occur a lot more frequently than you would expect. These data are pretty noisy, so we see 
you know, there are a bunch of, bunch of sort of low complexity cameras that occur too much. That's a common sort of artifact from the sequencing. Again, we already know that the quality, of, something went really weird with these data such that the quality value, there was a huge set of reads that had like this terrible quality value. So something went weird at some point. You may want to try to do some additional sequencing if at all possible. Okay, so that was kind of step one was to try to, you know, do that level of analysis. That's, that's fast to do. You know, it only takes uh, on the order of uh, you know, a few minutes to hours to be able to get that sort of analysis of your data in a really uh, 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 deep way, do some in sort of detective work of your data. Now, the next thing that we really want to do is do some analysis of the coverage that we have. Uh, because I told you before, you know, your, your project is, ma is, is mathematically doomed if you have very low coverage. Now, if we had the genome and we you know, had a good mapping algorithm, we could figure out the coverage just by kind of you know, scanning across here. You know, here, there's just 1x, 2x, 3x. But of course, we don't have the genome. We don't have you know, this, this, this profile. So really, it's a question of you know, how can we generate one of these profiles without having the genome first? So if we kind of dig into this and we, and we think about, you know, what is it that we're really trying to capture, and we kind of zoom in on some section of one of these, of, of one of these uh, pileups here, to say that you have 3x coverage means that there's something like three reads that, that share some sort of common sequence that's present. So uh, in particular, these three reads all share this, the same three letters, ACA, ACA, ACA. Now, now of course, ACA is so short. We're going to see this all over the place. But if we do this same sort of analysis with longer fragments, it'll actually be possible to um, uh, get an, uh, an estimate of, of the overall coverage just by doing this sort of camera analysis. So the sort of cartoon version is, is over every single read, we're just going to count up how many times do I see every possible camera. That's going to make some sort of profile. Hopefully, it looks like this. So this is a real profile generated from human sample NA12878. And this is, you know, this is good evidence that we have something like you know, 30x coverage. Uh, we can actually learn something about the error distribution because this part over here is pretty low. There's not a huge amount of repeats present in human. <coughs> when I apply this to wheat, uh, also sequencer, uh, Colt Spring Harbor, you know, we get this nice peak targeted. We get this bigger peak of errors over here. So this can give us some clues that there might be something going on there. Uh, but overall, it you know, looks, looks OK. And then going back to the question over here, sometimes you'll get a profile that looks like this, where you'll get a double peak. In, in politeness to the, my collaborator, I won't say what genome this is. <clears throat> but this is, this, is, this is bad news. Because what's going on here is you know, we're, we're, we want to sequence uh, this particular crop. Uh, it was known to be heterozygous. We didn't know how heterozygous it is. Parts of the genome that are homozygous, you're, you're effectively going to have two copies of every uh, base in it. So that's going to be uh, at something like uh, 40 or 45 x coverage. But the parts that are heterozygous, you're only going to be able to read off once. So at half of that coverage value, you'll get the second peak. So this is the, these are all the camers that are uh, heterozygous coming from the two different haplotypes. And then here are the homozygous co uh, camers at, you know, at, at double the coverage. It's bad news in the sense that all the assemblies that we've tried to do have been very poor using Illumina data. We have some molecular data for this that we're able to put together, which just because it's able to span over uh, much bigger regions of the heterozygosity. Uh, again, I'm interested in these types of data, so if you ever generate this plot, let me know. I'll, I'll try to work with you. So it's a couple of steps to generate that type of plot. The way I would recommend doing it in the discovery environment is we're going to start with our FASTQ files. Uh, it's, it's just one step to convert them into FASTA uh, files, which is just like a regular sequence file. Then we can use this nice pipeline, uh, actually, that, that Josh worked on back in the day. It'll do some analysis of uh, the camers that are present, and then we can build up a nice profile of what those uh, 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 camer distributions look like. So let me, let me show you what that looks like in the discovery environment. I think in the interest of time, I'm, I'm going I'm to kind of zip back and forth between the ovens very, very quickly. So again, the first thing that we would need to do is run the uh, FastX tools. Oops, not FASTZ, FASTX. And there's a tool in here, FASTQ to FASTA, uh, that all, it's really easy to use. All you have to do is like, you know, drop in what the FASTQ file is that you want to run, push go, 
and then it'll convert that to FASTA. I'm, I think everyone's familiar with FASTA formats, so I'm not going to show the details on that. <coughs> then the next thing that we're going to do is run the suff it's called the suffix orator. So let me just do suffix. Uh, Josh put this in here. And then what we can do here is we just drag and drop in all the FASTA files that we want to do this analysis on, push go. It's, it's two steps. The, the suffix orator is going to do some uh, uh, preliminary sort of organization of the data. So let me, and then there's another step that then does the analysis of cameras that are present. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to take this FASTA file, drop it in here. So now we have one uh, read loaded. I'm going to take this other file, drop this in here. Now I have my two uh, FASTA files that are present. They have the same name, but they live in different directories, so it'll do the right thing. I'm going to launch the analysis. Now that's going to get queued up to do some initial analysis of the sequences that are present. Switching back into my other oven, here's the output for all of this, where I've gone ahead and created what's called the uh, enhanced suffix array of all these data. It's these complicated data formats that, that uh, encode all the data, all the relationships between them. But really, the punchline is then once that's, once that's done, I can run uh, the make index uh, command. And all I have to do is you know, tell it um, what size camera I'm interested in, what's, what sort of, what's the minimum length I'm interested in, you know, put in where that input is, click go. And then really, the, the main sort of output from that, let me show you right here, is going to be this file. So in this example, I was looking at uh, 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 cameras that were 19 base pairs long. Here it just makes a little text file that you can render in you know, any of a number of programs. You can put this into Excel. And this says that you know, if, we, if we look at cameras that occur twice, there's this many of them. Cameras that occur four times, it makes this many of this one, and so forth. And really the, the key takeaway from this is, so from these data, if, we, if, we sort of, if you can imagine sort of the histogram that would be associated with this, there's this nice peak here at 10x coverage. And then there's no other peaks that are present, so it's, you know, it's clean data in the sense that we have 10x, and it, there's no heterozygosity that are present. OK, so let's go back. So now that we've done our assessment over our data, uh, the next step is going to be to run all pass. Uh, all, again, all pass has this really nice property that you don't have to do a lot of fiddling with the parameters. You just more or less tell it. Uh, what, are the, what are the FASTQ files, what are the library characteristics, and it'll automatically on the fly figure out a lot of the important parameters. So let me, let me show you how that works. So I'm going to go to, I'm going to get rid of this, go into the apps, I'll pass. So there's two versions of I'll pass that are available today. There's kind of this uh, generic one, vanilla one. That is, is situated for uh, very large genomes running on this very big cluster. The only, uh, that's probably what you're going to want to use for most eukaryotic genomes uh, uh, in the sense that it doesn't have a lot of RAM available for it. There's another version that is available to just do you know, microbial genomes. And the issue is, is they, get, they get scheduled in their different queues. There's kind of a fast queue and a slow queue. If it's just a small genome, you want to go in the fast queue with the small genome version. If it's a bigger genome, you want to go in the bigger version. There's a, there's a ceiling on how long it can run for. I think it's like two days. That'll be fine for genomes up to a few hundred megabases. If you're looking at many, many gigabases, you probably want to contact me or other people on iPlant. We can help get you set up uh, with a separate allocation that will, that will let you go for longer uh, periods of time. So let me just uh, click on this so you can see how it works. So the, the kind of the main thing is, is we need to tell it about all of the uh, FASTQ files associated with this project that we want to assemble. So by convention, I'm just going to call one of the libraries a fragment library. It's going to be a paired in 180 base pair. So that you, what you do is, is you give it a mean size and then a standard deviation. A good rule of thumb is if you don't actually know the standard deviation on the size, just give it like 10%. So from 180 base pairs, I'll just put in uh, 18. And then I'm going to drag and drop in um, the FASTQ files, which I have over here, so it'll know uh, where the data are to run. So this is the fragment library I want to assemble. I'm going to drag in uh, the first FASTQ file uh, and the second FASTQ file. There's no, there's, if, you need, if you need to do some trimming, 
of the you know the first few or, few or first last bases, you can go ahead and do that. So that was the you know the fragment library information. Now we can do the jumping library information. This in this in this data, this is a 3,500 base pair library. I'm just going to give it 10 percent. The nice thing is it's going to reestimate all that, so you don't have to be that precise with your estimates. And then I'm going to tell it it's a jumping library. Uh, short jump one. Short jump two. And then uh, there's this is just the two libraries, so you don't need anything else there. Run settings, we're going to tell it you know, approximately how long we expect it to go. Uh, that'll just determine which queue it gets put into. You know, it's better to error too high than too low, because it will you know, preempt your job if you think it's going to take a long time. This is a, this is a small microbe, so I think it's just going to take you know, like an hour or so. And then that's it. I just click launch. Uh, you know, behind the scenes on this very big cluster, you know, all the data is being moved around. It's being loaded into all pass, uh, uh, and then it's going to go ahead and do all those phases that we talked about, about error correction, doubling, unit taking, scaffolding, so forth. Let me switch back into the other oven where the results are done. And then the first thing to notice is that it, pro it produces quite a lot of output files. There's, I don't know, there's, you know, here's like the top level directory, there's other directories. The main files that you want to go after are going to be in, there's going to be a subdirectory called all pass, then there's going to be a directory called assemblies, then run, and then inside of here, the main sort of, uh, the key files are going to be this assembly.report file, which is just a text file, a final assembly.fasta, that's going to be the FASTA file of your scaffolds, and then a, a final context.fasta. So let me bring up the assembly uh, report file. So this is going to summarize all the different phases of all pass running behind the scenes, some information about the error correction. Uh, a, a really key metric is that in this filled fragments, you want to see that like all your paraden reads were able to be put together. It's going to tell you about how it re-estimated the jumping libraries. Uh, things look pretty good here. And then probably the, the, the number one thing that most people are going to want to look at first is going to be this summary right here, where it says like the N50 size of your contigs and your scaffolds. So here the N50 size is 150 KB, awesome. Uh, Contig size, 1.5 megabase scaffold N50, awesome. This is a fantastic assembly. You know, all things being equal, this is probably a publishable result that you'd be able to work with. Again, the actual sequence files that are going to be in this um, uh, uh, final assembly.fasta and final contigs.fasta. OK, so now we're in the home stretch. We've gone through the process. We've done the assembly. We're super happy with the results. Uh, the only other step that you might be interested to do is try to assess the gene content that is present. There's this really nice pipeline uh, for eukaryotic genomes. There's this really nice pipeline called Kegma, and the spirit of it is is that you know now that we have dozens of eukaryotic genomes assembled and, and available, there are certain core genes that just occur in like every single eukaryotic genome, like all the all the genes for building up uh, you know ribosomes and and um, uh, other sort of you know housekeeping genes are just are just are just ubiquitous, right? Every every single eukaryotic genome has to have certain things present in them. Uh, in Kegma, they've gone ahead and, and like across the tree of life, they've been able to characterize all these different gene sequences. So what they're going to do is they're going to they're going to scan your assembly to see well what fraction of these genes that we really expect there to be present are they truly uh, indeed present. So in, in this example, I've run Kegma, which is looking for core eukaryotic genes on my microbial assembly, which is a bad thing to do in the sense, you know, in the sense that we're not going to get great results. But kind of the main takeaway from this analysis file is that something like only uh, 31 of these core eukaryotic genes, of which th there should be 250, were identified in my assembly. That's really suspicious. That might be a really good clue to go back try to do some additional assembly work to fine tune you know, uh, a lot of the work there. It, uh, th there's often a sort of a detective element to an assembly project. We try to figure out you know, why is this all confused. And that's where I'm really going to leverage those KMA profiles, the, cat, the FASTQ profiles, you know, try out uh, different trimming algorithms, try to tune some of the adjustments there. Fortunately, Allpass will do a lot of that for you, but you may need to do some uh, on your own. The way to do that in the discovery environment is super easy. I'm just going to go uh, click on Kegma. 
And then all you need to do is uh, select the FASTA file for the scaffolds, push go, and then it'll generate one of those reports for you. OK, so just to kind of summarize all the steps we did, we're going to you know, start with from initial reads. That's pretty easy. Do some pre-assembly assessment of it. You know, run an assembler. In, in discovery environment, there's uh, probably a dozen assemblers available. Again, I recommend all pass, but you know, the number two choice is probably going to be SOAP de Novo or Abyss, depending on the data requirements. Then I just gave you one of the ways that you can go and try to assess the, 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 the result of your assembly. Here are some uh, additional resources available for you. Of course, the number one resource is going to be the iPlant uh, URL. That's going to be the portal into all this information. I strongly encourage you to check out that Assemblathon uh, paper where they've ranked all the different assemblers. All the assemblers I've described today are open source. Uh, here's the more information on all the different pipelines. Now, of course, uh, I didn't do all this work by myself. There's been a huge team of people. In my own lab, my postdoc, Shoshana, and my student, James, have been really uh, helpful with everything. And I also really want to especially acknowledge Roger, uh, who's been able to help me get all these assemblers up and running. And then in addition to all these people, of course, we have to thank you know, the entire uh, iPlant uh, collective collaboration, of which there's this huge list of people that have made all of this work. So with that, I will thank you very much. I'll be happy to take any sort of final questions. And then I think we have a short break before Josh goes on. Like, give you guys a moment to sure. so go ahead and ask, and then I'll ask the online questions. I just want to tell them to go bring the coffee in. <laughs> OK. Any uh, questions there? So let me ask. I, I have my own mic, so I can ask the online questions. So one of the earlier questions is if, uh, about cleaning up your, your reads during QC, um, yeah. if you have vector contamination and things like that. Uh. So they just want a quick question about how do you do that? Uh, yeah, so, so the, the FASTQ, or excuse me, the FASTQC report will give you this plot of overrepresented KMERS. So if there's like a vector or barcode at the ends of your reads, that'll probably light up as a signal that are present there. So FASTQC knows about all the standard Illumina adapters, so it'll actually say, oh, your data is contaminated by Illumina adapters. Uh, then in that FASTX toolbox, there are some tools that can go in. You can either trim you know, a certain number of bases, maybe the first 10 or the last 10. Or I think there's, there's a tool available in there that will recognize the adapter sequences and then chop them off for you. Uh, uh, that's super critical to do. Right? So if you have two reads from different parts of the genome that happen to have adapters, they will likely overlap with each other, introducing kind of this chimeric join between distant parts of the genome. This can be death to an assembly project, and it can really contaminate your results. Uh, another question was with the uh, increase in long sequence technologies, when will there be a seller option in the DE? Do you know anything <laughs> about that? Was that Roger that posted that? Uh, it's, 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 uh, it's definitely on our horizon. You know, it's, a, it's a priority to try to make that happen. We, today, it's not available. We've been, we've been doing some initial prototyping to make it happen. Uh, my, my best sense will be sometime next year. A KEGMA for the discovery of HDT events and genes incorporated in viruses from their hosts. Ah, so KEGMA is specifically as an assessment tool, right? So it's, it's, it has this internal catalog of about uh, 250 core eukaryotic genomes. So no, you're not going to be able to use that directly to say if there's a microbial gene that's been inserted into your genome. I think, though, as a side effect of some of the gene, uh, gene annotation that comes later, there's going to be various blast searches and things that are going to be run that may be able to identify that. Another question is, is it possible to do allo polyploid plants that are obligate outbreeders? <laughs> and we expect lots of heterozygosity <laughs> and multiple copies of genes. So, so normally I'm excited by you know, hard projects, but I think I'm going to have to pass on that one. <laughs> no, I mean, the, the reality is, is the, the, that's a really complicated genome. Uh, it, it far exceeds what people have been benchmarking against. It's going to be beyond the research frontier. Uh, I think the right thing to do is going to be to you know, try to apply some of the long read technologies to be able to recognize and separate as much heterozygosity as possible. But just to give you my very frank assessment, that's going to be a hard genome. Two questions, two last questions. One of them is quick. One of them is, does Kegma use BLAST? Uh, yeah, behind the scenes, it's, it, it's doing a variety of searches. There's a, uh, there's a BLAST search, and then there's also um, 
like an HMM type scoring of the sequences as well. And the final question uh, before the break, is it possible to use HiSeq uh, paired in 150 or MySeq 250 300 reads instead of overlapping PE 100 reads? Uh, it is not supported out of the box. I have been able to do things like that successfully. Uh, the trick is, is you kind of have to fake it, right? So if you have a 250 base pair reads, from that sample your own overlapping pairs, feed that into the assembler. It's, I mean, it seems kind of silly. Feed that back into the assembler, it'll put them right back together, and then the assembly will progress. Using a trick like that, I was able to have a hybrid assembly of 454 and Illumina that came out you know, really, really well. It's just not supported kind of using the default buttons. OK, so I think we want to thank Mike for all this valuable information. Thanks, Mike. And um, all the slides and everything will be available online as well as recording. So we have coffee in the back. We're going to break for about 15 minutes. Then we're going to go and talk about once you do have something assembled, what does it do? What's an annotation? Uh, so we'll get to that. So let's take about 15, and we'll see you in a moment. All right. Thanks. Thanks very much.